All right, guys. So uh, the last time I read to you, it was the Jewish holiday Rosh Hashanah. And I guess this tells me that I need to read Pax more often because the next time I'm reading to you is the Jewish holiday Yom Kippur. And I'm out. It's Wednesday and I'm home. And um, and uh, now, uh, even though I'm home, I'm reading to you Pax chapter 15. Chapter 15 is a Pax chapter. We left off chapter 14 where we learned all about Vola and how um, she had that kind of nervous breakdown at the grocery store and she decided she wouldn't leave her grandparents' house until she knew more about, about herself and it's been a number of years that she has not left that, that house. And now we're at chapter 15 and uh, Pax is with Gray and they're searching for um, a safe place to go that, away from the war because the crows have been bringing news of war coming. So they want to leave away from the war. Okay, chapter 15. And I started this earlier, but I didn't get very far. Chapter 15. The sun burned through a dawn fog. The two foxes had been traveling for hours, but Gray was slow and rested often. So they had only just reached the valley basin. For the most part, Pax respectfully flanked the older fox. But sometimes he broke away to race at full speed for long, glorious minutes before circling back. He had never run before, not really. He'd sprinted around the borders of his pen or across the yard. But this running was a different thing. Neat oval paws healed now, skimming the ground only for traction as he galloped faster and faster over great sweeps of grass. He must really enjoy running. Yesterday's meal had cleared his senses and fueled his muscles. But now the eggs were gone from his belly and the smells of the warming valley brought on a powerful hunger. Where the humans were, there would be food. How far? Two days travel. Gray described the place of old stone walls where the earth smelled faintly of tar and hemp, bordered by a river. We will reach it by dusk. The human settlements are another day's travel beyond that. Pax did not remember human settlements. He did not remember a river. Of his home, he remembered the looming door he remembered oaks ringing the house, the overgrown remains of a flower garden he was never allowed into, the sounds of a road. He sensed that other humans lived along this road, but he never encountered them. These memories, memories were fading, as was the memory of being caged. He could no longer recall what the sky looked like through the hexagons of cage wire. He remembered his boy, though. The hazel eyes with the odd round pupils, the way Peter would close them and throw his head back and yelp something near a bark when he was delighted. His salty neck that smelled sometimes of sweat and sometimes of soap. His hands always moving with the scent of chocolate with Pax loved and of mitt leather which he loathed. As the two foxes traveled on, Pax reflected on the puzzle of the other scent of his boy. His underlying scent, it hung between grief and yearning, and it welled from a deep ache for something that Pax could not ever divine. He could never figure out what made him so sad. And we know it's probably the loss of his mother, but Pax didn't understand that. Sometimes in the boy's nest room, that's his bedroom, this grief yearning scent was so strong that it overpowered everything else, and yet his boy never, I'm sorry, and yet his boy made no move to acquire whatever it was he wanted so badly can't get his mom, his mom is dead. Whenever Pax caught that scent, he would hurry from wherever he was to find Peter, flung across his bed, clutching the objects he hit, kept hidden in the bottom drawer of his bureau, his face set in hard ridges. Pax would nose Peter's shirt sleeve or claw up the curtains, then pretend to lose his footing and fall to the floor. <laughs> Anything to get his boy to play. But when the grief yearning scent was strongest, none of his tricks would work. On those days, Peter would shoo Pax outside and shut the door. Remembering this, Pax felt the urge to run again, but not for the joy of it. This war that was coming, are you sure it will harm all in its path? Even the youth? Everything. It will destroy everything. Pax nosed Gray, respectful but urgent. They must hurry. The older fox studied the younger one. For a moment, then they began to trot. 
They crossed the marshy seam of the valley and climbed the rocky cliffs, shoulder to shoulder this time. At the top of the rise, the two foxes stopped. Gray was panting hard. He's an old fox. He's out of breath. Ahead, the pines towered up, promising long, cool pools of shade. But the markings here were strong. The challenger hunted this territory, and the threat in his scent was unmistakable. And almost immediately, the ground beat with the light staccato of paws tearing toward them. Pax and Gray had barely graced themselves when the tawny fox burst from the underbrush, lips curled in a snarl, tail lashing. Pax shrank back, but Gray advanced calmly, his body lowered enough to declare non-aggression. We are only passing through. The challenger ignored the peaceful greeting and sprang, hitting the old fox in the flank and pinning him down, and then sank his teeth into Gray's thin neck. This fox is not very friendly, is it? At Gray's pain scream, Pax's guard hairs lifted and his heartbeat quickened. His muscles thrummed with a fury he'd known only once. In the early days with his humans, the father had raised a hand to his boy, and Pax had shot across the room without thought. Small kit teeth tearing fiercely through the man's pant leg. He was protecting Peter. Now, as it had then, his back arched, and a low growl rumbled deep in his throat. The challenger spun around in surprise, and Pax charged him headlong. They rolled, teeth clipping at tender ears, hind claws digging for purchase in soft belly fur. The yellow fox was more skilled, but Pax's fighting was fueled by an instinct to protect. When his teeth found the other's throat, the challenger scrambled to his feet and backed off whimpering. Good job, Pax. Pax leaped in front of Gray, shielding him as, as he'd shielded his boy that long time ago. Lifted his chest and growled a warning. Stay away from Gray, he growled. The challenger slunk away. Good job, Pax. Pax shook off the blood from a dozen superficial scratches. He wasn't hurt that bad. And then cleaned Gray's wound. The puncture was deep. He urged Gray to go back. No, I will travel. I hope Gray's going to be okay. The two padded steadily for an hour through light woods, Pax restraining himself to keep pace with the ailing Gray, relieved at least that they were kept moving. But when a murder of crows, that means a group of crows, landed in the bare arms of a pecan tree, Gray doubled back and sat down, at its base, ears pricked up intently at the commotion. Pax waited, not patiently. After a moment, the old fox barked for him. The war is moving closer. How do you know this? The crows, listen. Pax cocked his head. More shrieking birds swept in, descending into the lower branches, then flapping up again to higher perches in a cyclone of distress. They're upset. The crows hulked their shoulders, spiked their feathers, jerked and dipped their shrieking beaks. Their discord set Pax's nerves on edge. There was disorder. He attended more carefully. What he sensed alarmed him. He tried to describe it. Air choked with death. Fire and smoke. Blood in a river. The river running red with it. The earth drowning in blood. Chaos. Everything is broken. The fibers of the trees... The clouds, even the air, is broken. Yes, war. Where? Pax attuned himself once more, west. Still distant, but nearing. And now a small group of war sick, that's what he calls the people who fight in war, war sick. And now a small group of war sick has come from the south to meet it. From the south. Pax paced while Gray struggled to his feet. He offered again to travel alone, and Gray refused to turn back home. Again they set out, and again their pace was slower than Pax wanted. They stopped only for a meal, only for meals of grubs and berries, and whenever they did, Pax searched the air for any trace of his boy's scent. For the faintest sound of his voice, none, none. He lifted his muzzle and bade a single aching note. It had been so long since he'd seen his boy. Before this, they'd never been apart for more than half a day. Often, Peter would leave in the morning, and Pax would pace his pen 
in increasing distress until the afternoon when Peter would come home, smelling of other young humans from school, and of the strange breath of the large yellow bus that delivered him. So he came back from school. With the afternoon, Pax could reassure himself his boy was all right, examining him for any sign of injury before he could relax him to play. It was afternoon now, he bade again, and this time Gray lifted his voice in an echo of loss. But when Pax trotted back to the path to resume the journey, Gray faltered and fell. Pax could see that he needed rest. He led the wounded fox to a mossy circle of shade beneath a pine. Gray laid his cheek on his paws. Before Pax had even finished cleaning his wound again, he was asleep. As Pax kept watch, he thought of doing favorite things with his boy when he found him. Tumbling together outside, playing hunting games, exploring the grassed yard, and the bit of woods behind it. He remembered the, the ways his boy would reward him. The full smiles of greeting, the thorough neck scratching, Peter's fingers digging in just hard enough. He recalled the peace of lying at his boy's feet in front of the fire. These thoughts calmed Pax, and he dozed with the memory of Peter's knuckles kneading the loose skin between his shoulder blades, so real that his fur ruffled under it. Till a shifting breeze brought a scent that called him to an instant alert. Meat. Roasted meat. The kind his humans sometimes cooked over a fire in the yard. His boy would feed him bites of meat dripping with fat. Mm. For days afterwards, Pax would scour the ashy fire bed for overlooked scraps. Even the charred bones were treasures. Pax got to his paws to sniff more deeply. Yes, roasted meat. He knows the sleeping gray. Humans are near. Gray moved more easily after his rest. And the two foxes kept up a loping pace. As they got closer, though, Pax charged ahead. His body was light. The fat burned off from days of scarce food. He ran as foxes are meant to run. A compact body arrowing through the air at a swiftness that rippled his fur. The new joy of speed, the urgency of coming night, the hope of reunion with his boy, these, these things transformed him into something that shot like liquid fire between the trees. Something gravity couldn't touch. Pax could have run forever. Until he galloped out from the woods and saw ahead of him a wide river. Beyond that stretched a clear field, flat, and then rising up to massive crumbling stone walls. It was dusk now, and at the far corner of the stone ruins, a dozen men were gathered around a fire, eating. Beyond them were a cluster of tents and several large vehicles. The wind had shifted to the east. The grilled meat smoke still hung heavy in the air, but Pax could only get a general scent of the humans. He bounded up and down the river's edge, frustrated, but from no direction could he differentiate one human scent from the other. At least Pax knew his boy was not here. None of the humans had his reedy form. None moved with the same quick energy. None held himself as Peter had, upright, but with a downward cant of his head. His head would be down a little bit. He was relieved. The other scents of the encampment, smoke, diesel, scorched metal, and a strange dark electric odor. These were things he would have herded Peter away from. So he's glad that Peter's not there because there's some smells that are dangerous smells. Dark electrical odor, scorched metal, smoke, diesel. These are not good smells. So he's glad Peter's not here. It doesn't seem like a safe place. What do you think is there? Gray limped from the woods and flopped to the riverbank beside Pax. Beside Pax. Together, the two foxes watched the men they had finished eating, but they remained around the fire, talking and laughing. They are war sick? Pax wanted to know. Not now. They are peaceful now. I remember this peace. The old fox curled his forelegs under his chest. At the end of the day, the humans I lived with gathered like this across the river. Suddenly, Pax remembered. He had seen something similar as well. It hadn't happened for several years, but sometimes at the end of the day, his humans would sit together on his boy's nest. The father would lay a hard box, flat and thin, and made of many layers of paper, across his lap. 
paper like Pax's own bedding, but not shredded, and with many marks. His humans would peel these layers, one by one, and study them. Pax remembered that his humans were most linked together on those evenings, and with their harmony, he could let his guard down. A box with papers, peeling one layer at a time. And that's when the father and the boy were most linked. That's a book or a reading. Pax felt a strange sensation as if his chest were no longer large enough for his heart. The foxes turned back to the men. Some were still crouched around the fire, while others moved with lanterns between the equipment and the tents. With full darkness, the remaining men rose from the fireside. They dumped out mugs of coffee, scuffed dirt over flames, and ducked into tents. Gray rose also and limped uphill to the protection of a sweeping hemlock bow. He circled and circled himself up on the pine-needled ground underneath, his nose tucked under his brush. The smell of meat had made Pax too hungry to rest. He trotted to the edge of the river. Its current was soft. He dipped his head and drank, and then jumped to a rock, slippery with moss but stable, then gaze fixed on the glow of the dying embers he chose. A leap, a splash, and again his body did what it had never done before, but was meant to do all along, and he swam. A moment later, he climbed the bank and shook himself off. Neither movement nor sound came from the tents. Pax crept silently across the field and climbed the rise. He circled the bounds of the camp, edging closer and closer to the fire bed. He wants to get some food. The sense of danger was strong. It was hard not to flee. He was, after all, accustomed only to his two humans, the one he loved and the one he tolerated. Several times he crept to the very rim of the fire bed, found the smell of the meat laced with the warning scent of the warsick men, and leaped back. Kept getting close to the meat and would jump back because he's afraid of getting caught. A discarded pork bone, still redolent with fat, proved too much to resist. Pax darted in. As he gulped the meat, ash gritted but still warm, the rustle of canvas startled him, and he froze. A man emerged from a tent, silhouetted by lantern light. He stretched, and a long shadow snaked snaked out to cloak the watching fox. The man turned away and relieved himself on a bush. The scent of his urine traveled to Pax, and he bristled to a sharp alert. <gasps> his boy's father. So we just found out that one of those men who just came out of the tent to relieve himself was Pax's father. I'm sorry, Peter's father. Pax could smell the scent. Oh boy, it's getting good, huh? That's the end of chapter 15, so hopefully you were listening carefully and you'll get an A-plus on this Ed Puzzle video.